Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our patent workshop today. With me is Mr. Ben Kimes. He's with Lowenstein Sandler LLP, and he's a California Lawyers for the Arts board member, and he's been a panel attorney with us since 2012. Mr. Kimes consistently provides above and beyond patent pro bono service for us and his patent pro bono clients, and he has multiple USPTO recognitions and awards to his name. If you need help filing a patent with the USPTO, please contact California Lawyers for the Arts. We can get you matched with an attorney through our California Inventors Assistance Program. So without further ado, Mr. Kimes, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Keegan. So as he mentioned, I'm a partner with the law firm Lone Stein Sandler. I've been doing patent law since around 2002. So I've been doing it for a while. Started getting involved with the pro bono patent work uh, back in 2012, you know, when we set up the California Inventors Assistance Program, and, and I've been an active participant in that program ever since. Today's workshop is really just to give you the basics on patent law, uh, how you go about filing a patent application, preparing an application, and what patent law is all about. If you have questions during the presentation, you're muted, so you won't be able to ask them, but if you can use the chat function, and you can just write a question and then I'll try to pay attention to those questions and, and ask them. So patent law is a regional law. So the US has its own patent law. Every other country has their own patent law. If you get a patent, it's only good in the country in which you filed the patent application. So that means if you file an application in the US, you will only ever get a patent in the US based on that application. You can file for the same application in any country that you want and there are treaties between the countries so that if you file in one application, one country, you can file the same application in other countries, but it becomes an expensive process when you're filing in multiple countries. But just something to keep in mind is where you file an application, it's, it's only good in that one country or multiple countries if you file in multiple countries. So in the US, all patent law is just based on one small section of the constitution. That's article one, section eight. And it just says that Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and the, the right to, to give uh, people exclusive rights to their uh, inventions. And, and just based on that one clause in, in the Constitution, we, we have the entire U.S. Patent Trademark Office with you know, tens of thousands of employees. Now, what's the purpose of patent law? Patent law, it gives an inventor an exclusive right to some technology. And in exchange for that exclusive right, the inventor is teaching the country how to practice that invention. The inventor, he explains his invention to the public. It has to include, the, the application has to include all of the information necessary to educate the pub, public about that invention, which means it, it has to be like enabling. Someone needs to be able to read the application and then go and practice the invention without too much experimentation on their part. The purpose of that application is to allow the public to learn how to practice that invention. So a patent, it, it gives you exclusive rights to the technology for a term of 20 years from when you file that patent application. So in, ex in exchange for teaching the public how to practice that invention, you, you get to be the only one to practice it for 20 years from when you file that application. Now that's, that's in contrast to trade secrets, which for, for a trade secret, you don't teach anyone how to, how to practice the invention. Instead, you keep that invention to yourself and then that, that trade secret never expires, but you don't get the right to exclude others from practicing the invention. So if someone else discovers this, the same technology or comes up with the same technology themselves, they can go ahead and practice it. In fact, they could even then uh, file for a patent application on it if your invention was kept secret. So it's, you, you have to weigh the pros and cons of filing a patent application versus keeping some technology trade secret. A patent doesn't actually actively give you the right to do something. All it's giving you the right to do is to prevent others from doing something. So even if you have a patent, that doesn't mean that you yourself can practice an invention because there might be other prior patent rights that, that cover something similar to what you have. Like you might have developed a new way to do something, but the original way was broad enough that it, it, your, your new invention still reads on that old invention. 
So just because you have a patent, that doesn't give you the right to do something. All you can do with that is prevent others from making, using, selling, or importing the patented technology that you have a patent on. So that's an important thing to note is, is it actually doesn't give you an active right to do something. So just to give you a, an example, let's, let's say Nokia invents a mobile phone and then Palm, I don't know if you guys remember the Palm Pilot, but it, they invented a personal digital assistant, um, some, something like a precursor to a phone uh, or to a mobile phone. So Nokia invents the mobile phone, Palm invents the touchscreen PDA. Now then later Apple came along and they invented the smartphone, which is essentially a combination of a mobile phone um, with a touchscreen PDA. So if Nokia has patents on a mobile phone and Palm has patents on a PDA, Apple, even though if they get patents on smartphones, can't necessarily make smartphones because the smartphone is a type of mobile phone and it's a type of touchscreen PDA. At the same time, if Apple has patents on a smartphone, Nokia and Palm also can't make and sell smartphones because Apple has patents on the smartphone. And so in that kind of situation, in order for Apple to make or sell smartphones, they have to get permission from Nokia and Palm. Basically, they have to license the patents from Nokia and Palm. Similarly, if Nokia or Palm wanted to make and sell smartphones, they would have to get a license to Apple's patent on the smartphone. So that's an example of a situation where even though you have a patent on something, like Apple has say has a patent on the smartphone in this case, it doesn't give them the right to go and make the smartphone because they would be infringing potentially other people's patents in doing so. All it gives them the right to do is to prevent those other companies from making and selling the smartphone. So why are patents important? So companies use patents for various purposes. It could be for defensive use. So just to protect the company's technology or to prevent others from entering the market. Companies also often get patents just in case they get sued by another, by, by a competitor, um, so that if they do get sued, then they have some ammunition to counter sue. Some companies use their patents offensively, which means they actively go out and seek other companies who are infringing their technology, and then they either try to license their, their patents to those other companies or they sue them. The, and patents are also a company asset. Um, for startup companies, often the, the IP, like patents, is, is one of their few assets, and it helps in their valuation when they're, when they're getting uh, funding from investors. There are two main types of patents in the U.S., and that's a utility patent and a design patent, and they, they protect different things. So when, when we usually think about patents, we think of utility patents. And a utility patent protects the functionality of something. It protects like, what that thing is actually doing, as opposed to a design patent, which protects the look and feel of something. So if you could get a design patent on a certain ornamental design for a chair, you didn't invent the chair, it has the same functionality as other chairs, but it looks a certain way. So design patents are used to protect slightly different types of things than utility patents. And I have some examples of design patents and utility patents uh, later in this presentation. So utility patents are the most common type of patent. They usually protect an invention better than a design, design patent because a design patent can't protect functionality. And uh, design patents are generally easy to design around because all you have to do is change the way it looks a little bit and then you wouldn't be infringing a design patent. For a utility patent, it has to include a detailed technical disclosure and generally includes drawings illustrating what the invention is. A design patent, on the other hand, has to have drawings. And in fact, it's almost exclusively drawings. There's very little text in a design patent. And both types of applications have to have at least one claim. And the claims list the elements of the invention and define the scope of the invention. So a patent application generally has three main parts. That'd be a specification, that's the text describing what the invention is. It has the figures, that's the, the illustrations showing it. And then it has claims. And the claims 
are the section that actually define the legal scope of your coverage. That's what courts look at when they decide if somebody's infringing your patent. And they're also the most confusing part of a patent application or a patent to read because they're written in, in a really bizarre way. And it's basically one long run on sentence. So what can be patented? In the US, it's basically anything under the sun made by man. Uh, it includes uh, machines, articles of manufacture, processes, methods, compositions of matter, and improvements to any of the above. So one thing that's important to note is most patents are not some profoundly different thing to, to what's been patented before. Generally, it's just a small incremental improvement on what's been done before. So maybe you didn't invent the microchip, but you invented some small tweak that makes it half a percent more efficient. You could get a patent on a microchip with that small tweak. As opposed to utility patents, design patents cover a configuration or shape of an article, a surface ornamentation on an article, or a combination of those two things. As I said, pretty much anything is patentable as long as you invented it and it hasn't been done before. And that's, that's true for both design patents and utility patents. And for a design patent, basically they just look to see if there's any one single prior piece of art that has the same design as what you're trying to file a patent application on. And if they can't find anything, then you get a patent. And that's for a design patent. For a utility patent, they look to see if there's any single reference that, that has the same functionality as you're describing and claiming. If they find one reference, then they would reject it for lack of novelty, but they can combine it with other references. So if, if they find three references that together teach what you invented, then, then they would reject it for lack of non-obviousness. So they'd say it would have been obvious to, to invent what, what you invented. And then those situations arise 99% of the time. And then it's up to the lawyer to argue with the Patent and Trademark Office about what is and what's not obvious. So as I mentioned previously, uh, patent application is generally divided into three parts, the specification, the drawings, and the claims. In order for patent application to be patentable, you have to satisfy two criteria. One is novelty and one is non-obviousness. So to be novel, the invention is novel if all of its features cannot be found in one single prior art reference. And that's generally a pretty easy threshold to meet. The more difficult threshold is non-obviousness. And that's, would it have been obvious for an, someone of ordinary skill in the art to combine or modify known technologies to arrive at the invention? So what, what an examiner does is they, they do a search and they find maybe one or two portions of your invention in one reference and one or two portions of your invention in another reference. And then they say it would have been obvious to combine the teachings of those two references to arrive at your invention. Obviousness can be a, a tricky concept to get. So I have a few examples to run you guys through to try to help solidify what might or might not be obvious. So here in this first example, so let's assume that invention is an application that A, searches for a cheapest airline reservation and B, sends an automatic email with the result. So let's assume then that there is a prior art reference, which is an application that searches for the cheapest airline reservation and that nobody before has ever combined searching for the cheapest airline reservation with sending an automatic email with the result. So in this case, an average programmer would easily be able to recognize that search results could be sent by email. Results are sent by email all the time. And so this would be a case of an obvious invention. And, and the, the examiner at the patent office would, would reject your application in this case. So here's another example. An invention is an application that A, searches for a cheapest airline reservation and B, searches for the cheapest rental car. So let's assume then that there's one prior reference that searches for cheap airline reservation and there's another prior reference that searches for the cheapest rental car and that nobody has combined these two concepts before. So again, in this case, the average programmer would likely be able to combi combine these two references to say it'd be, easy, it'd, it'd be easy to search for both the cheapest airline and the cheapest car and to put these two things together. 
And so this probably wouldn't be a patentable invention either because it'd be considered obvious. Okay, so here's a, an example of an invention that probably wouldn't be considered obvious. So the invention here is an application that searches for searches car and airline databases to order and identify an air, airline reservation in a car rental combination. And it does it in such a way that it maximizes frequent flyer miles. So in, in this example, let's say that prior art reference one is an application that searches for a cheapest airline reservation. And prior art reference two is a reference that searches for a cheapest rental car. So even though in this case, there was prior art that searches for the cheapest airline and searches for the cheapest rental car, there's some additional non-obvious operations that are being performed in the invention in that it's combining these two things in such a way that it's maximizing frequent flyer miles. And so that's a qualitatively different result than what those two prior references by themselves were doing and is different from the first two examples in that there wasn't really a qualitatively different result in those first two examples as there is in this example. Okay, so you guys on the line I'm, I'm assuming are interested in getting patents on some inventions and doing it in a pro bono manner. And so what is pro bono? Pro bono means free legal services. So attorneys that do work on a pro bono basis, they, they are not charging their clients for the, for the attorney work or for the attorney fees. But pro bono doesn't actually mean it's free because there are still charges that the Patent and Trademark Office requires that you pay. And there, there are still like third party fees that you might have to pay for a patent application, such as like if you wanted to have a prior art search done and you wanted to hire a, a search company to do that prior art search, you know, you would still need to pay that search company. Or often patent applications require the use of a drafts person to prepare drawings for the application, and you would still need to pay the drafts person for those drawings. All pro bono means is that the attorney is not charging you for his time. However, attorney fees are generally the most expensive part of a patent application. And so if you do qualify for pro bono assistance, it can be a considerable savings. And so just to give you an idea, preparing and filing a new patent application is generally about ten to $15,000 in attorney fees. Whereas you know, if it's done on a pro bono basis, that would be a cost of zero. And if you already have an application filed and you need help in like responding to an office action, the attorney fees for, for that type of uh, action are generally around two and a half to four thousand dollars. And then if if you were preparing and filing a provisional application, the attorney fees for that are generally around two to four thousand dollars or more if it's closer to a full application. Um, so again, pro bono means no attorneys are not charging you for their time, but you still will be on the hook for paying for fees charged by the Patent and Trademark Office, fees charged by a drafts person, fees charged by a search company. You should note though that there's no requirement to have a prior art search done. So you can avoid that expense just by choosing not to have a professional prior art search done. You know, that's something that the Patent and Trademark Office, it's their job to do. But some people like to have prior art searches done to get a sense of kind of what their chance of getting a patent issued is before they go through the process of preparing and filing a patent application. In general, anyone who qualifies for pro bono assistance will also qualify for micro entity status with the Patent and Trademark Office. And what that means is that the Patent and Trademark Office will only charge you a quarter of the normal fees for filing a patent application and for do, doing certain other um, types of filings uh, after an application is filed. So just to give you a sense of what the costs are. The micro entity status filing fees are around $450 as opposed to around $900 for a small entity. A small entity is a, any company that has fewer than 500 employees. And then the, the standard fees for filing an application for like large companies, it's generally around $1,800 or 
there to $2,000. So all in, you know, if you don't need to use a drafts person and you don't have a third party search company do a prior art search, the, you can expect the cost just to file a patent application to be about $450 to $500. And then you should also factor in that there's a small administrative fee that a California Lawyers for the Arts charges for finding and placing you with a patent attorney. And I believe that's $125. Just a quick rundown of the patent process. So the, the first step is to draft and file a patent application. This process generally takes around three months from when you initially meet with a patent attorney to when they can provide a, a, a draft of the patent application. And then you, you review the application that they send to you, make sure that it fully captures your invention and there, there are no errors that need to be corrected, like a misunderstanding as to the invention or the technology. You know, there might be a little bit of back and forth with the attorney. Once you approve that application for filing, the attorney will send you some formal documents to sign that generally will include a, a microentity status form where you declare that you qualify for microentity status so that you can pay only the $450 as opposed to like $2,000 to the patent trademark office for the filing. And then you have to sign something called a declaration, which basically just declares that you believe you're the inventor for, for the new application. One thing to keep in mind is that in the US, you have one year from the first public disclosure of an invention to file for a patent application on that invention. Once that one year mark is passed, that invention is considered dedicated to the public. So you lose the right to file a patent application on that invention if you wait more than a year from when it was first publicly disclosed. That's just something to keep in mind. You should keep track of when you're disclosing your invention to third parties. You know, if you're talking to companies about it, it's helpful to get non-disclosure agreements if it's possible. You know, if it's just a matter of you telling, you know, a few friends about your invention, that probably wouldn't rise to the level of a public disclosure. Generally, it's better to be safe and try not to disclose it un until you, you're ready to file a patent application on it as much as you can. So once you file a patent application, the Patent and Trademark Office will review the application to make sure that it just meets the formalities. And if they see any errors, they'll send out a notice for you to correct the application. Like if you didn't pay all the fees that you were that were due, if they see any issues with the figures, maybe one of the figures was outside of a margin line or the lines weren't dark enough, or you provided handwritten drawings and they didn't think they were clear enough, you know, they'll they'll give you a notice saying, please provide updated figures correcting these issues that we identify. You know, that there are some other you know, informalities that, that they might catch and they'll give you a certain deadline to correct those. So in the patent pro bono program, generally the way it works is the attorney represents you just on a limited term basis, which means that they are agreeing to help you maybe prepare and file the application, but not to represent you for the whole period from filing to allowance of the application, because that generally takes a number of years. So it, it's up to you to keep track of when the application is filed and to look for the communication back from the Patent and Trademark Office and read through it to make sure that they don't identify any deficiencies. Because if they identify a deficiency, they're going to give you a time period within which you need to correct those deficiencies. Generally, any attorney who works with you on a pro bono basis, will that engagement will include correcting any deficiencies that were identified. But the notice of these deficiencies probably won't be sent to the attorney. They'll be sent to you directly. So it's up to you to look out for that mailing and read it when you get it to make sure that if there are any deficiencies that you let the attorney know so that they can go ahead and fix them. If there were no deficiencies, you'll still get a mailing from the Patent and Trademark Office just telling you, you know, that they received the, the application, giving you an application number and a filing date. In either case, assuming that if there were issues, you responded to those, or if there were no issues, then eventually the application will get a 
assigned to a patent examiner, and that patent examiner will do a prior art search and determine if they think that your invention is something that's patentable. In 99% of cases, the examiner will say, your invention is not patentable, and they will issue a rejection. And in response to that rejection, you can you can choose just to abandon the application by not responding, or you can, if you disagree with the rejection, you can prepare a response stating how they're wrong. Or if you agree, you can still respond, but in this case, by amending your claims. So when you file a patent application, the claims generally have a lot less content than the detailed description. So you can amend the claims by adding additional subject matter to them based on what was written in the detailed description but hadn't yet been claimed. So in the rejection that the patent examiner provides, he'll tell you why he thinks the prior references teach your invention. And you can look at those references and you might say, oh, he's right. They do teach it as I had it claimed. But in my invention, I said that this thing could be blue. And in, in the prior reference, it's red. So you know, in that example, you could amend the claim to say, and it's also blue, in addition to whatever limitations you already had. And then you could respond to the Patent Trademark Office saying, we've now amended the claims as amended, you know, that they ad include additional limitations which were not found, are not found in the prior references. And then the examiner will do an updated art search and see if he can find those additional limitations, either in the references he already found or in new references. And there can be back and forth between you and the patent office multiple times. So the, the average is about three rounds of communications with the patent and trademark office before it, it's either finally allowed or, or the applicant decides that, that it, there's not really anything patentable there. Generally, it takes about a year and a half for the patent and trademark office to issue the first office action and then after that, each round of prosecution generally takes about another six months. You get three months to respond to a communication from the Patent Trademark Office, and after you respond, they generally send a new communication within another three months or so. And these time limits are, are extendable, but you have to pay money to, to extend the time. So generally, you don't want to do that. Eventually, hopefully, you get a notice of allowance. And once you get that, you have a set time period to pay an issue fee. And once you pay the issue fee, it takes about a month for the Patent and Trademark Office to issue your application into a patent. And then even after the patent issues, you still have occasional maintenance fees that you have to pay to the Patent and Trademark Office. And if you fail to pay those maintenance fees, the patent will become abandoned. And there are three maintenance fees that you have to pay for a patent. One at three and a half years, one at seven and a half, and one at 11 and a half years from the date of issuance. And each maintenance fee becomes progressively more expensive. So the first maintenance fee is the cheapest, then the, the second one is more expensive, and the third one is even more expensive. And when you get an office action from the Patent and Trademark Office, that will indicate a time period within which you need to respond as well. And failure to respond in that time period will also result in the application and going abandoned. So I just have a few quick examples of some utility applications, basically that companies were built around. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the company Dropbox, but their company was built around the idea of network folder synchronization. And you know, here's here's a figure from one of their early patents that detail how multiple clients can share and synchronize folders and contacts across the network. And if you're familiar with the company Square, their first product was this little dongle that plugs into the audio jack of a mobile phone or a tablet uh, to enable anybody to take a credit card payment. And this is a figure from one of their early patents on the, the device that they used to enable anybody to take credit card payments. And uh, interesting fact, this device was actually prototyped and built at a, a makerspace uh, here in the Bay Area. Those two patents that I just gave you uh, examples for were utility patents, but I had mentioned that there are two types of patents in the U.S., utility patents and design patents. Here are a few examples of design patents. So you might recognize this. This is the design patent for the Apple MacBook Air. The reason that a design patent might be valuable for a company such as Apple is when anybody looks at this design, they think of an Apple product. If Apple didn't get a design patent on this particular design for a laptop, then 
competitors could make laptops that have the same shape and design as as this MacBook Air. And that might, you know, cause confusion for customers, or maybe Apple just doesn't want anybody to be able to make products that look exactly like their products. So other companies are still free to make laptops. They just can't look exactly like this. Similarly, Apple, they also got a design patent on the ornamental design for the graphic user interface for, for how you display and flip through album covers for iTunes. And you'll note in this figure that some lines are solid and some lines are dashed. In a design patent, any lines that are dashed are not actually being claimed. So in this figure here, it doesn't matter what the phone actually looks like. It's just what the solid lines are portraying that make up the claim to the patent. So, you know, it's this side scrolling album art for music that would actually be the claim here. And then here's, here's an example of a design patent that Google got for their, their home screen. Design patents, even though they're not used as much, they can be valuable. Um, the, the big litigation that went on between Samsung and Apple, that was largely over design patents for mobile phones. And that turned out to be a, a multi-billion dollar payout to Apple, or judgment anyway. And that was largely because of Samsung phones violating uh, design patents owned by Apple. So I would like to open it up to questions now. Does the USPDO usually correspond by mail? They will send out electronic notices, but most pro se inventors or inventors like participating in this program probably are not set up to receive those electronic uh, notices. So probably you can expect to receive them by mail. I don't know what the process is to set up, set yourself up to receive notices electronically. Is it something that our administration has, has already had in place? So it's not something I've had to deal with. When you discuss your invention in public and the one-year clock starts, what do you have to do within that one-year period? So you have to file the patent within one year from the first disclosure. So also, if you file a provisional patent application, you should note that you have one year from that original filing to file a non-provisional application covering that same invention. I didn't really go over provisional patent applications in my presentation, but for those that are interested in provisional applications, there are no requirements for what they have to include. They don't even have to have claims. It's just anything that you provide to the Patent and Trademark Office that might describe your invention and they don't review it. They just basically put a date on that and say, yes, we received it on this date. And then from one year from that date, you need to file a full application. If inventors do opt to use a provisional application filing to give, to basically buy more time to file a full application, you should know you only get protection for, for what you're describing in that provisional application. So, you know, if, if you only describe features A and B, and it turns out that feature C was something you were working on, and but you forgot to describe it there, you're not going to get a priority date for feature C because it wasn't described in that provisional application. So it, it's something that, that can catch up or trip up some filers of provisional applications that they're think, they think they're getting more protection than they actually are. How much does it typically cost to hire a draftsperson? A draftsperson will generally charge somewhere between $50 and $75 or even up to $100 for complicated figures per figure. What is the key difference between a design patent and a trademark? So a, a design patent is, it covers the look and feel of an object. A trademark is, it's basically a completely different area of law and it's meant to convey to the public the source of goods or services. So a, a trademark could be just a word or a slogan or some symbol or some symbol plus a word or slogan. But the purpose of trademark law is totally different from the purpose of patent law. Do you have to prove that your invention works or can you just patent the idea? 
you don't have to prove that your invention works and you don't have to have actually like built your invention. The filing of a patent application is considered a constructive reduction to practice, which means it's as if you built it when you file the patent application. But that being said, you need to describe it in enough detail that someone can go and practice the invention. So if you're leaving out gaping holes in how, how you would make it, and someone couldn't figure that out without a lot of experimentation, then your patent's not gonna be worth that much. Can you provide some examples of what public disclosure looks like? Public disclosure would be like if you post your invention online somewhere, or if you gave a presentation to a group of people about your invention, if there was any kind of publication of your invention, if you offered to sell your invention to a company and describe to them what that invention was. You know, th those are a few examples of a public disclosure. How much are maintenance fees? Similar to filing fees, maintenance fees can be reduced if you're a micro entity. For a micro entity, the three and a half year maintenance fee is $400. The seven and a half year is 900. And the 11 and a half year is $1,850. And that's a quarter of the standard maintenance fees. Can a person renew a patent after it expires? No. Once a patent expires, that's it. But if someone has a patent application that became abandoned or an issued patent that became abandoned for failure to pay a maintenance fee, you can try to, to revive that, that abandoned patent application or patent. You, you have to submit a petition to the Patent and Trademark Office and you have to submit a fee to them and you have to assert that it, it was abandoned unintentionally. But if you do that, then there's a good chance that that they will revive the abandoned patent application or patent. Can you modify your invention between the time you file your provisional and non-provisional application? And if so, are there any consequences for doing so? Yes, you can. You can modify your application between the provisional and the non-provisional. Like I said, you, you only get protection like the priority date of the provisional for whatever was described there. So all that means is that the modifications aren't gonna benefit from the earlier filing date. They'll get the filing date of the non-provisional. I have clients do that all the time. You file a provisional application and then they make advancements to that in the the year between you know when they filed and when they need to file the non-provisional and generally will incorporate those advancements into the application that ultimately gets filed. If company A holds a patent and company B gets a patent granted for a similar device, where does the USPTO stand in the lawsuit that then occurs? Is the USPTO sued as well for issuing a similar patent? No, the, the, US, the USPTO wouldn't be a party to that at all. It, it would just be patent infringement litigation between company A and company B.